So I'll be telling you about dark matter and an experiment that we've built to detect dark matter particles. So, okay, dark matter. You might have heard the term. Uh, dark matter is this gravitating stuff that's full, filling the universe. It's a major part of our galaxy, and it doesn't emit light. It doesn't absorb light. But there's a huge amount of it in terms, gravitationally speaking. There's just a lot of dark matter, and we don't know what it is. Okay? But we do know that dark matter is something very unusual. It's not made of protons. It's not made of neutrons. It's not made of quarks. It's something, some new kind of particle that we've never detected before. And 23% of the energy composition of the universe is dark matter. And actually about 80% or more of the mass of our galaxy is dark matter. Dark matter is what clumps together and causes galaxies to form in the first place. If it weren't for dark matter, none of us would certainly be here. And <clears throat> there's a lot of evidence for dark matter. It's not just this thing that physicists have cooked up to be, to be uh, because we don't understand stuff. There's a lot of evidence for dark matter. If you look at how light bends gravitationally, gravity bends light around galaxy clusters, and you can see rings that, that are produced as a, as a result, and, and the stretching and the images of galaxies, that's evidence for dark matter. If you look at the cosmic, uh, cosmic microwave background, the microwave imprints of the early universe, the, the fingerprints of the Big Bang, you can see evidence for dark matter. And if you look at the stars going around galaxies, the velocities of those stars are much higher than they could be if you only had the, the gravity due to ordinary matter, stars and galaxies and gas, stars and gas and stuff like that. So there's all this dark matter, and we don't know what it is. Now, one I the ideas for what dark matter is, it's called a WIMP, a weakly interacting massive particle. So weak is a technical term, actually, in physics. And it refers to something uh, interacting through the weak force. It's one of the four forces of nature. And this idea is not entirely crazy that you could have a weakly interacting particle that's never been detected yet that's heavy enough to, be, to cause, bring enough, enough gravity to hold these galaxies together. Because there, we already know of a weakly interacting particle that we detect all the time. It's called the neutrino. Now, neutrinos are whizzing through us all the time. They're going through the Earth all the time, going through you all the time. If you take your thumbnail and you point it up toward the sun, not sure what direction that is, if you point it toward the sun, you're getting about 60 billion neutrinos per second through your thumbnail. Okay? Physicists get used to this notion that there's a lot out there in the universe and around us that we can't sense with our, with our you know, five senses. Neutrinos, this enormous amount of energy flowing through us all the time in the form of neutrinos, absolutely exists. We detect neutrinos all the time. We have sophisticated, sensitive instruments that do that. So if there's a, but if there's a particle that's like the neutrino, weakly interacting, but heavy enough, it could be the dark matter. And this is one of the main scenarios, main hypotheses for what the dark matter could be. And a lot of physics, you know, theories beyond what we already know about, something called supersymmetry and other something called extra dimensions, predict the existence of one of these heavy, weakly interacting particles. And they could have been produced in huge numbers in the Big Bang, would still be around us, going through you and the Earth all the time, like it's hardly there, but providing the gravity to make galaxies form. Okay, now we detect neutrinos, we can detect dark matter particles too if we have a sensitive enough instrument. And okay, this is the only equation I have, it's just this rate, r equals n rho sigma v, some rate in your detector is, it goes like the number of particles in your detector times the density of dark matter times the velocity of dark matter uh, times a velocity. And the typical velocity we think is some hundreds of kilometers a second. That's a typical velocity for articles, for planets, for uh, stars that are stuck in the Milky Way galaxy halo. And you can look for, occasionally, a dark matter particle scattering in your detector. And what do you need to be able to see that? You need a detector that's really low in radioactivity, 
a really low rate. You need to look for very low energy events, like sort of X-ray sorts of energies. You need to be able to reject ordinary stuff like neutrons and gammas and betas, more typical kinds of radioactivity. And you'd like a big detector so that you can be more sensitive, boost up the number of particles that you're, that you're looking for the dark matter with. And typically, you look for heat deposition or light produced by particles or charge that's produced in an interaction. Okay, so for the rest of this, I'll be telling you about the Lux experiment. Lux stands for Large Underground Xenon Experiment. And there's about 100 people working on this, very talented, capable people from a variety of institutions in uh, the US and the UK and Portugal. And um, what we use as a target is liquefied xenon. So xenon is a noble gas, a rare gas. It's about, you can find in the atmosphere at about one part in 10 million. And you can buy xenon gas. And you can liquefy it. It's a cryogen. It liquefies about minus 100 degrees centigrade. And if you have a, a bucket of liquid xenon, the particle interacts in it, you get a flash of light. And if you apply an electric field to the liquid xenon, you can actually extract charge, electrons, out of the event and drift them tens of centimeters through the liquid xenon to be detected. So this is how it works. You have a, basically, I said, a bucket of liquid xenon. And you surround it with very sensitive light detectors. We can detect individual photons with something called a photomultiplier. And we look for flashes of light from the initial event. And then we drag the electrons through the xenon and detect the electrons when they get pulled through gaseous xenon at the top of the detector. From the time between those two flashes of light, we get the depth of the event. And from the pattern of the flashes of light in the different photomultipliers, we get the xy position. So we get 3D reconstruction of every event that happens in our liquid xenon detector. So here's a schematic. We put our cryostat inside a big water tank. And the water tank shields you from radioactivity from the, from the rock. Another thing I told you about neutrinos, which were crazy enough, but even something more standard is that we are all surrounded by natural radioactivity. We're surrounded by gamma rays, neutrons. Everything around us has a little bit of radioactive stuff in it. Everyone in this audience is radioactive, especially from potassium, which is a radioactive uh, nucleus. We're surrounded by radioactivity. That radioactivity is a background. It hides the possible events due to dark matter. So we take our super sensitive low background instrument, we put it inside a big water tank, ultra pure water, and we remove that radioactivity using the water to shield out those, those gamma rays and neutrons. So that's the big water tank you see there. And then the detector itself is a terrific shield against uh, radioactivity, as I'll show in a moment. So here are some pretty pictures. We define an electric field with these field rings, uh, stepping down in voltage and providing an electric field that's uniform throughout the instrument. We use a lot of Teflon, which is a terrific, terrific, terrific reflector. You can see in this picture all the many photomultiplier tubes that detect the light that's produced by the liquid xenon. These detectors are all immersed or at liquid xenon temperature. And so more pictures. Turns out Teflon, a lot of the white stuff you see here, is a terrific reflector for the light that's produced by the liquid xenon. Now, I was saying, if if you will, want a really sensitive instrument, then you have to get rid of the radioactivity. And one of the really powerful things about liquid xenon is that a particle that in enters into the liquid xenon, like a gamma ray or a neutron, is very unlikely to scatter just once. A dark matter particle will be very lucky if it scatters even once. But all these more standard kinds of backgrounds are more likely to scatter more than once. And if that happens, we can immediately tell in our detector because we get multiple flashes of light. And we can see that. And this allows us to greatly reduce the backgrounds, effectively, in our detector. And the blue part in the middle is the quiet part of the detector. And the quiet part inside the detector, there are very few of these single scatter events that a dark matter particle could produce. And that allows us to get extremely low backgrounds. So I mentioned that we shield our detector with a big water tank, and you self-shield it with the liquid xenon. But also, it's very important that we go very deep underground. Okay? Why is that? Because cosmic rays 
from the upper, are banging into the upper atmosphere. They're making charged particles that rip through us all the time, called muons. And to get away from that kind of background, we have to go deep, deep underground. And the rock shields out those muons. So about one per hand per second, muons going through you. If you go deep underground, it's like one per hand per month or so. Okay? And that allows a quiet environment to do these experiments. So where did we go? We went to the Sanford Laboratory at Homestake. It's in South Dakota. It's right near Deadwood, okay, the site of a famous gold rush. It's not coincidence, because right near there, there is a mine. Okay, the Homestake mine, which has the largest total gold production of any gold mine in North America. Okay? Now it's been turned into a laboratory called, called the Sanford Underground Laboratory. And there you can see the mine shaft where the lab begins. There's quite a warren of dugout rock underneath that space where the gold was. That's been dug out. And right at one part of that, there's something called the Davis Campus. And here's a map of that. And you come down the shaft. And just a short distance away, uh, you can come to a super high tech, low background, clean laboratory. It's very James Bond. So, Here's a schematic of it. You can see the water tank. You can see where the Lux detector goes. It's multiple levels. Okay. So this was just uh, ideas on paper just a few years ago. Okay. In 2011, they started excavating the laboratory here in this big cavern. Okay. And um, you can see the Lux detector as it's built, various parts of it. We have to be very clean. Dust is radioactive, so we have to be careful. And uh, here it is, the Lux detector bearing, being carried off to the mine shaft to go underground. And here, pictures of a new high-tech clean lab deep underground, and the water tank, and the electronics, and the Lux detector itself. And here are many of the, you know, the graduate students and postdocs <coughs> installing it, putting, to get, putting it together. OK, here's what you see when you come down into the underground laboratory after down the mine shaft. Okay, and then off to the left over there is the clean laboratory. Okay, and there's the, the water tank on the right there, the stairs down to the lower level. Here's what it looks now like on the upper level of the underground laboratory. And you can see that basically below this level is where the water tank is in the Lux detector. And there it is, there's Lux. It's in a titanium cryostat mounted there in the middle of this water tank. Those globular brown glass things you see on the sides are other photomultipliers, light detectors, that go inside the water. And now we've filled this water tank. We've completely filled it with water. Uh, here's another view of the Lux detector. All the white stuff on the walls is Tyvek. It's the stuff that you get for insulating houses, it's a but it's a terrific light reflector. And now that detector is cold, and it's full of liquid xenon. And we're going to do a, a search for dark matter this year. And on paper, it should be the most sensitive dark matter experiment in the world. So it's a very exciting time. And uh, we're looking forward to new results from Lux. So that's it.